soul after death um, and our the church's view on um, death and life after death and it's a very common question that is put to us um, as uh, priests and um, there's also a lot of ideas and thoughts that, that people share amongst themselves that are sometimes very profitable for us to hear and to, to learn um, and also there are some things that are downright wrong that uh, might lead to a wrong understanding of, of uh, the soul after death. Among the spirits of the righteous perfected in faith, give rest the Saviour to the souls of your servants, protecting them in a life of blessedness that is lived with you a lover of humankind. Hello, I'm Father Stavros Carvelis. I'm a priest at St George Greek Orthodox Church in South Brisbane. Um, I am married to Presbyter Estella and I have two children. We recently moved to Brisbane a couple of years ago to uh, serve the needs of the church here. The reason why we actually have prayers for the departed in the Orthodox Church is simply that we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God hears our prayers and that those prayers in some way that we don't fully understand um, give comfort to the person that's the soul of the person that has departed. So um, in, 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 in a spiritual way we actually believe that those prayers help the departed person, give them some kind of comfort. Um, as St John Chrysostom taught that uh, the prayers for the departed help them in a way that we don't fully understand but we know give them some, of, some kind of comfort before the presence of God. Upon us, O God, upon which your great mercy we ask you, hear us and have mercy. And we pray for the repose of the souls of the servants of God, Dimitrios, Alexandra, Constantine, the Amantos, Lavrula, George, who have fallen asleep, but have been forgiven every offense, both voluntary and involuntary. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And the Lord our God may place their souls for the righteous rest. Mercies of God, the kingdom of heaven, and forgiveness of their sins. Let us ask of Christ our noble King and God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of mercy. The common, the common question is to us though, what happens between death and that time? That's a very common question. What happens to our souls from the point of death until the, the, uh, the second coming of Christ? Uh, and it's a very interesting question. Uh, basically, we can start by saying the church has never dogmatized, in other words, officially presented a teaching upon the nature of the soul from the point of death before the second coming. Um, but we do have teachings from our mystical saints that, that can tell us a few things. Um, and a lot of our church customs and traditions are centered upon, centered upon um, these beliefs. It is the teaching of the church that the, at the moment of death, the soul is separated from the body. Um, our teaching is that the body and the soul before death are one entity, that in the Greek, the word psyche actually means life, not soul, like we understand it in a platonic sense, where the soul is something alien or separate from the body. But before death, the human person is one living being and the body is part of that unity. But at the moment of death, we believe that the soul is separated from the body. 
we believe in, 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 according to the Orthodox teaching, spiritual teaching, we believe that the um, soul enters the presence of God immediately. Um, so although it's in stages where a person, um, after they die, it's actually according to the Holy Scriptures, according to the Gospel of John, if someone dies believing in Jesus and are baptised in a way either physically and believing in that baptism or even desiring baptism as some of the fathers teach, then they will enter the presence of God and they will experience the presence of God like a kind of beginning, like a, a, like a form of, like an introduction. Uh, it's not the fullness which comes at, at the time of at the second coming, but it is definitely the idea is that they are enter the presence of God. Um, so there is a there is the teaching is that they do enter um, paradise through the presence of God. They experience a foretaste of paradise from the moment of death. There is a. a a erroneous understanding of, of this idea of the soul, the existence of the soul after death, and that people think that it's like the Hollywood, you know, the 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 the, the um, poltergeist or you know the, some kind of ghost that, that returns and visits us. Our our church doesn't teach that. Um, while we believe the soul exists apart from the body after death. It is only through the grace of God that, that, that uh, people, after they have died, can touch us in some way that we only know. Um, the church does not believe in you know, people being visited by spirits or ghosts after death. In the Orthodox Church, we teach that when we die, not only our body dies, but our soul also dies, that there is a separation of the body and the soul, okay? And at that moment, at that moment, we have a custom where we say a series of prayers for the soul called the Trisayum, or three, three holies, taken from the very well-known hymn of Ayus Ophios, Ayus Eskiros, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Mortal, have mercy upon us. It's the Trisayun hymn that we chant in the liturgy, in every liturgy. And so the prayer is taken from the fact that we start that, that the prayers for the dead with the Trisayun, with uh, reciting the Holy, the Three Holies. Um, and within that prayer, within that, that service, that very brief service, there is a prayer that we read for all of the departed. Uh, o, God, o God of all spirits, of all flesh, who has trodden down death and overcome Satan, bestowing life upon this wo your world. O God of spirits and of all flesh, who have trampled down death and crushed the power of the devil and given life to this your world. Do you, O Lord, give rest to the souls of your servants who are asleep? Vimitra. Dimitriou, Alexandras, Constantinou, Diamandou, Stavroulas, George, Venerias, Simos, Georgiou, Febronias, Aspasias, Kaliopis, Stylianou, Stylianis, Elenis, Tyrannis, Sebaias, Maria, Constantinou, Tom, Dimitriou, Georgias, Stelou, in a place of light, in a place of green pasture, in a place of refreshment, from where sorrow, mourning, and pain have all fled. Every sin committed by them in their life, by word, or thought, or deed, forgive them as a good and loving and merciful God. For there is no one who lives and is without sin. Only you, Lord, are without sin. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your word is the truth. To the prayer to the person who has departed, um, who has fallen asleep, we ask that you grant rest. So there are, this prayer is um, 
for the departed soul of the person that has passed away because we believe at that moment of death uh, the person who has passed away it's it's a significant moment in there I mean obviously it's, it's a very powerful moment when that occurs where something spiritual happens whereby the angels of God come and are with the soul um, and so we pray for the soul at that moment of death. So usually, traditionally, uh, people will um, call upon the priest to say this service at the moment of death. Uh, although it largely, in modern practice, that has fallen uh, not, not as common as it used to be, but um, it is still done by people that are aware of the tradition. Um, it is common practice to also have this brief service on the eve before someone's funeral uh, where the priest will be called to say these prayers um, uh, uh, just on the eve of the funeral so that the, uh, so that the family can be together, say their final goodbyes, uh, view the body, view the person in, 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 the, in the coffin and then have the prayers read by the priest at that moment to help them um, give them a bit of spiritual support. So that, that is when those prayers are said. The prayer is also repeated in within the funeral service, although other things are added, um, other propari are sung, other prayers are added, but pretty much the same prayer is read over the person on during the funeral service itself. According to the spiritual teaching of the church, there is a tradition around um, the 40th day being a very significant moment when a person, after a person dies, where they enter the presence of God and rest with God. Uh, we actually say that in the funeral service where uh, the soul, uh, the soul rests um, in the presence of God on the 40th day. So prior to the 40th day, there is a, a belief that the soul of a person is present with us but like I said earlier it's not like some kind of Hollywood poltergeist scenario where we're being you know haunted by the souls of our beloved departed God allows that allows that person through his grace through his the Holy Spirit which unites and binds all of us uh, to experience and uh, us and be aware of us and and in some cases people interpret that and see themselves being aware of the person that is departed but it's only through the grace of God it's not something independent of God God allows certain things to take place prior to the 40 days where the person is present with us well it is absolutely the teaching of our church that we do not believe in the doctrine of purgatory or hell material hellfire um, we believe, well first to answer the question initially, we have faith in God, that God uh, is in their care, God, God is, uh, has them in his care, and that God is uh, taking care of their, of their, of their well-being, wherever they, in whatever the state that might be in a mystical way. The teaching of the church um, is that while we believe the person is separate from us and away from us and that is the pain the biggest pain is the separation and the, 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 the uh, from that person that we love we have to have faith that God being God is in control and, and has those people in his care but um, we don't believe in some kind of purgatory we do we do believe in um, the person in there in being in the presence of God they, they go through some kind of purification some kind of preparation before they enter the presence of God in the fullest possible sense but we don't know exactly what that entails that preparation that's why we have the, the memorial services that we do on the third and the ninth day of a person's passing and the 40th day and then every and then the third 
sixth, ninth month and twelfth month, the one year anniversary of a person's passing because we believe that is the way we participate in caring for our beloved departed who have passed away. It is the teaching of our mystical fathers and, and, and fathers of the church that hellfire is not, that, that there is there is no material hellfire, that hell is actually the presence of God, not his absence. Like hell isn't a place that we go to for if a person is evil or des is deserving of, of that kind of existence. Um, it is not the absence of God or God's punishment or God sending us to a place. Hell, uh, according to the, the very wisest of, of our fathers, is actually a person being in the presence of God and not wanting it. It's like being, it's like locked in a room with a person that you, you don't like or hate or don't feel comfortable with. So that is why we, 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 you know, we live the Christian life. We believe that that prepares us for that time when we will meet Christ after death. And that experience will not be a torment or something that we see foreign or something that's strange or uncomfortable. It won't make us feel uncomfortable, but indeed it will be a paradise. It will be something that will be the, the, the absolute natural conclusion to our hopes and dreams. Whereas for a person that has, does not desire any of that, does not love Christ or uh, does not, has lived a life that has been away from uh, the will of God, then that experience will be the opposite. It will be a torment rather than a blessing. So that's what we believe about hell. So if there is a hell, hell is being in the presence of something that we're totally unprepared for, totally unfamiliar with, and uh, will be, you know, God will never, God would never cast out anybody. In fact, the more and more he tries to get closer to a person in that predicament, the more and more that person is trying to resist, then how can that be interpreted other than hell for that person? Prosphoro and Antoplasia are actually very interconnected, although um, it's a Prosphoro and Antoplasia are both a loaf of bread that are used in the church. Uh, both of them have similar seals, although not exactly the same. Uh, uh, in, through history, they've evolved into different symbols. But basically, um, the Prosphoro is the bread that is used, offered to the priest by the faithful, and used in the liturgy for to, to uh, prepare Holy Communion. So the priest will take a section of that bread out and uh, use it within the Divine Liturgy to, to uh, prepare and consecrate, ask the Lord to consecrate uh, and make the actual body and blood of Christ. So that's what the Prosphoro is used for. The Artoclasia, uh, and so just going back to Prosphoro before I go to the Artoclasia, uh, and people usually give the names of their, their living and their departed to the priest to commemorate in the Divine Liturgy. So uh, people usually bring a Prosphoro to church uh, after someone has passed away and offer it to the priest to be used in the Divine Liturgy where the person of the deceased will be commemorated in the Divine Liturgy. Um, there's a, there's a very strong tradition behind that. People believe in that, that actually helps a person that has departed. Um, as far as the Autoclasia is concerned, it is the same bread that is used to, uh, on a feast day, people bring five of them and it's used to commemorate uh, the miracle of the, of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish by Christ in the Gospels. Um, that's what it, what it symbolizes. But it's that, that symbolizes in itself God's blessing upon our material goods, upon our material life, upon our bodies and souls and, and our families. And people will bring the uh, five of those out of the Placia loaves with the same or a similar seal, a little bit different because it's not used in Holy Communion. And that bread is offered then to the faithful as a blessing. Uh, the people will bring the Antoclesia loaves, they'll bring the names of only the living and the family, so it's a blessing for just the living. And uh, they'll present those five loaves on a feast day, maybe it's their name day or the feast day of the Lord or Panahia, uh, like uh, it could be the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary. It's a big feast day in the Orthodox Church. 
And a lot of people bring those five loaves and bring the names of their loved ones who are alive. And they, and they are commemorated in the Antiklesia service by the priest. Uh, so it's differently, it's the di same loaf that is used for a different purpose. It is traditional for, yeah, as, as you said, Dimitri, to um, offer a list of names of living and departed with the Prosperor during the Divine Liturgy, basically because we believe, again, in the power of prayer um, and that the church militant, which is the people who are living before death uh, and uh, struggling on this earth, uh, are also joined with the church triumphant, which is the people that are departed and that are with Christ and are in the presence of Christ. Uh, we are united in the body of Christ. We are one body. And so we believe that our prayers offered in the divine liturgy uh, have a lot of value and do things, uh, help people that have part departed. And during the divine liturgy, the people that have departed continue to pray for us who are st still in, on pilgrimage on this earth, and so that prayer, that, 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 that dialogue of prayer helps both us and those that are departed. That is why we give the names to be commemorated in the divine liturgy. Traditionally, every Saturday is, commemor is specifically dedicated to commemorating and remembering, remembering uh, our beloved departed. So it's not just particular Saturdays, but every Saturday is really a time when we remember the, the beloved departed. Um, traditionally, in, 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 a, in an Orthodox home, people will finyasi or sense the house, their, their home, on a Saturday. Uh, and that is for the souls of our departed. We remember our loved ones who have departed on a Saturday every week. But there have been days that have been specifically reserved um, that where we do church services, we come to church, we offer the names of our departed to the priest to commemorate the divine liturgy, which have been called Psycho Sabata or Saturday of Souls. Um, there are three of them that are done just prior to Great and Holy Lent, 40 days before Holy Week, that we have, although in ancient practice it's just one, but then due to practical con uh, considerations, the amount of the names, it became two. And then the third one, which was also connected with the commemoration of Saint Theodore uh, and the baking of Corleva in his memory. That also became, uh, just through natural progression, a third Psycho Sabato. So those three Saturdays are done, and, and in, in a way, it's a part of our spiritual preparation that we commemorate our beloved departed uh, before Lent and any great uh, and, and Holy Week and Pascha. So uh, we, we pray for the departed because we believe their prayers will also help us in our spiritual struggle with fasting and all the other practices connected with um, our, our Christian uh, spiritual life. The other one is the one just prior to Pentecost. And so there again, uh, there is a, a feast day that commemorates the Holy Spirit the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit was sent by Christ uh, at Pentecost 2,000 years ago, that formed the Christian church that started, that confirmed the, the fullness of Christ's body. Um, and so it was only natural that the Christians would remember that our beloved departed uh, with and connected with the feast day of pretty much the creation of the Christian church, where the church militant and the church triumphant are united. There are a lot of practices, customs around surrounding mourning someone's passing. Okay, I'll just go through a few of them. Um, in, from the church's perspective, there is no teaching about how one somebody should mourn uh, the, uh, the, the beloved departed. In actual fact, the traditional way of celebrating, well, of commemorating the death of someone is to celebrate um, in, through our faith in the resurrection of Christ and the restoration of 
the, crea the, uh, the death being transformed into a passage into the life, eternal life of life with Christ and, and, and the Father and the, in the Holy Spirit, uh, the priest will actually wear white during the funeral service. The priest will not wear black. The ch priest uh, and the church would not, even though it is customary for many people to wear black, uh, dark clothes, the church actually teaches the opposite. It says that we should celebrate in some way a person's entry into the, into the eternal life of Christ. So, according to custom, though, and jury and, 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 jury and sensitive to people's feelings and people's emotions, the church has also embraced the, the, the custom of mourning. Uh, but, and, and it tolerates and, and embraces people in whatever state they might feel that they are in through their grieving. So uh, people will wear black in the church, although they don't, they're not told by the church to do so, it's just accepted. Uh, people will fast for someone that has passed away, even though the church doesn't teach that you have to do that. Um, uh, some people will do it for 40 days. Some people will let their hair, their bodily hair on their head and their, their face grow, so men will grow beards and so on and so forth. Uh, although that's not taught by the church that you must do that. Um, the church only teaches that we should grieve, um, but we should not grieve like those who do not have hope. So we should not let our mourning become a way by which we harm ourselves um, or we fall into depression or we lose our faith or we um, question the existence of God even though those things might happen and, uh, but the church silently embraces a person in whatever state they might be and waits for them to, to, to go through that process of grief they need to go through. So there are customs, uh, although not technically or traditionally taught by the church that we must do. It's teaching of the Bible that, that God is very, is, is very displeased with that form of, um, it's actually a, 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 a sin, considered a sin. And, and and there is a reason for that. It's not just that God doesn't want us to do something for no reason. Um, basically, when we do contact, when we try to access the spiritual world through mediums, we open up a window. And that window can let something good in, but it can also let something very bad in. So that's why church teaches not to use that medium because it can, access, it can connect us with very dark things, things that we don't understand. Um, there is a there's a story of the Desert Fathers when St. Anthony prayed to God and asked him and said, Lord, why do certain people die early, other people who are evil age? You know, ask the age-old question about why does unrighteousness exist and why, do, why does death happen to some people at an early stage and not happen to people until they're much older? And, and um, God replied to him, in, he was praying, and God replied to him and said, Anthony, you wouldn't understand, even if I told you, you wouldn't understand what I was, why these things happen, nor is it to your advantage to, to know anything about them. In other words, God was telling Anthony, there are certain things that if you were exposed to, would do you harm. And that is why I've commanded or I've asked that you don't, don't access that form of knowledge. So the church would, would ask us to not consult mediums and say to us, have faith in God, trust in God's providence and God's love for the person, person's care and commemorate that person through memorial services and through prayers and through our own visiting of a person's grave um, uh, and, and just remembering the good things about that person and praying for that person. That is a healthy way of remembering somebody. But to actually try to contact them through that kind of medium would expose us to things that we would not be able to handle. So the spiritual world is a beautiful world, but it's also a dangerous world. And we need to exercise discernment, uh, care and, um, and caution when it comes to things like that. 
Usually a church faces east, okay, in the easterly direction. And the altar faces east. Uh, and even when the priest serves the liturgy, he does not face the people, but faces with the direction of the people towards the east. East is the, traditionally the, the, the symbolic uh, direction of light. That's where the sun rises from the east. And so when a person, when, when, when a coffin is placed within the church, the body of the person also faces east because it is also traditional, it's a traditional uh, belief uh, that um, when, the, when a person is resurrected, they will rise and face east because that's where uh, the, the Christ will rise and uh, usher in the kingdom. So uh, east is, is traditionally the, the, the direction of light and uh, uh, joy and resurrection. It is the teaching of the Orthodox Church all over the world that we do not condone cremation, uh, even though that is now become uh, commonly becoming more regular with uh, the passage of time, with uh, people's beliefs changing, with uh, financial concerns with, uh, around burials and so on. Uh, basically, it's the reason that I mentioned earlier about how the Orthodox Church teaches that the human person is one being that we do not, we don't undermine the value of the body within the life of the human person, even after they die, even if, even after that body suffers corruption and decay. Uh, that we try to respect all aspects of the life of the person by um, laying them to their bodies in the ground in a respectful way, where nature itself can decompose the body. Um, but the act, of, the act of cremation or incinerating the remains of someone is, is, is like it would be, like it's like a form of refuse is, is considered uh, unbecoming of the care of showing care to a, a person who has passed away. That is why our church does not condone cremation. There's another reason um, where we... Uh, in, in the Orthodox Church, there is a tradition where we actually venerate or show respect towards the remains of our saints, the relics. Uh, and so uh, that is how highly we value the body in the role of our body in, in the human, our human lives. Uh, the other thing is that we also believe that at the resurrection, the general resurrection of everybody at the second coming of Christ, our bodies will be reunited to our souls it, albeit it will be a different form of a body uh, according to the teachings of St. Paul, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it will be a, a resurrected body. But nevertheless, it will be our bodies. And uh, we, we need to show due honour and respect to the role of our body in, in, in our life. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So our, in our, in our, in our, through our faith in our Christian life, we all believe that our bodies are also sanctified in addition to our souls and in our, in our walk with Christ. Eternal be the memory, eternal be the memory, eternal be the memory. question a lot um, and uh, I suppose that there are some things that we can say and uh, according to our church tradition, according to the Holy Scriptures and according to the tradition of uh, our, the Holy Fathers and Saints. Um, it's interesting that uh, our church has a very specific teaching about death, about why death exists, um, where it came from and what Christ has done with it and to it. Uh, the whole premise and center of our faith is based upon what God has done with death. Okay? Um, but basically, very, very quickly, just to put it, uh, if I can, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a summary, basically death, according to the, the teaching of the Orthodox Church, 
is something that is alien to God. Um, we are so used to, in, in our common discourse, talking about death as something natural, something that is a part of life, something that is the, uh, the end of life, biological life. And to many extent, from a scientific perspective, that is true. Death is the end of our bio biological life. But from a spiritual point of, what, point of view, according to the Orthodox faith, death enters existence as a rebellion against God's intention and plan for human life. Death enters God's, uh, into God's plan as a rebellion, as a, a foreign entity that, that in, in fa actual fact, God never intended for us to die, that, 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 that uh, death is foreign to God's plan for the human person. And yet, in the summary again, God tolerates death so that it can, earthly life can have its end so that our spiritual life can reach its fullness, reach its fullness and potential. So, when we pray, for example, in the Orthodox funeral service for someone that has passed away, that ha that's, is how death is approached in the service, that it's something that is a tragedy, is a, is a, is a tumultuous experience for the human person. Um, and that the separation of the soul from the body, which is the definition of death, is something that is a, a, a tragic reality that causes grief and sadness and pain for the people involved, uh, for the person that has passed away and so forth our grieving processes are, are very much embraced by our church that we need to grieve for those that have died because death is indeed something that is painful and, and uh, foreign to, to our understanding of, of a life lived in Christ. So, but coupled with that grieving is as St Paul teaches in his letter that we read at every funeral service, we do not grieve those that have passed away, our loved ones, like those who have no hope. Um, that we grieve, we cry, we feel sadness. Jesus himself cried and uh, wept at the death of his very close friend Lazarus, as we read in the Gospel of John. But though gr that grief is premised upon our hope and faith in life after death, that, that uh, in, in its very essence, the Christian faith teaches that God became human, took on our mortal nature without sin, of course, and conquered death, which is, culminates in the singing of that very, very powerful hymn, Christos Anesti Ek Negron, Christ has risen from the dead by death trampling upon death and upon those in the tomb is bestowing life. So, our faith, as I said earlier, is premised upon the uh, conquering, the defeating of death, the transformation of death into a passage into the life of God. So uh, that is what we premise our grieving upon. That is what we, we uh, partner our grieving with the hope in the resurrection from the dead which not only Christ experienced, but we also believe through our faith in him, through our baptism, through our participation in the life of Christ, we also will share in at the end of time when Christ returns and uh, resurrects everybody from the dead and uh, the, the, the judgment will take place. Blessed is our God always, now and ever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. 
now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. All Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, be merciful to our sins. Master, forgive our transgressions. Holy One, visit us and heal our infirmities for your name's sake. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father and to the Son for the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever unto the ages of ages. Amen. With the spirits of the righteous made perfect, give rest, O Saviour, to the souls of your servants, reserving them for the life of blessedness that is with you, O lover of humankind. In your eternal peace, O Lord, where all your saints are reposing, also rest your departed servant's soul, for you alone are the immortal one. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are our God who descended into Hades and ended the sufferings of all who are in prison, O Saviour. Also rest the soul of your servant now and ever unto the ages of ages. Amen. O only pure and spotless Holy Virgin, who ineffably gave birth to God, intercede for mercy and forgiveness of the soul of your servant. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your great mercy we ask you, hear us and have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Again we pray for the repose of the souls of the servants of God, Dimitrios and Alexandra, who have fallen asleep, and for the forgiveness of all their errors, both voluntary and involuntary. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. And the Lord God will place their souls with a righteous rest, and will grant to them the mercies of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the forgiveness of their sins. Let us ask of Christ our immortal King and God, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. O God of all spirits and of all flesh, who has trampled down death, crushed the power of the devil and granted life to your world. Do you yourself, O Lord, give rest to the souls of your servants, Demetrios and Alexandra, who have fallen asleep in a place of light, a place of green pasture, a place of repose, where there is no grief, sorrow or mourning. Forgive every sin which they have committed in word, deed or thought. You are a good God who loves all humankind. If there is no one who will live and does not sin, only you are without sin. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your word is truth. For you are the resurrection, the life, and the repose of your departed servants, Demetrios and Alexandra, who have fallen asleep by Christ our God, and to you we offer glory with your eternal Father and your all holy, good, and life giving Spirit, now and always and forever and ever. Amen. Glory to you, O God, now hope, glory to you, may Christ, our true God, who rose from the dead and is dominion of the living and the dead as immortal King, through the intercessions of his most pure and holy mother, of the holy, glorious and praiseworthy apostles, of our holy God-bearing fathers and mothers, of his holy and righteous friend Lazarus, who was four days in the tomb, and of all the saints, assign to the dwelling place of the righteous the soul of his servants, Dimitrios and Alexandra, who have departed from among us. Grant them rest in the bosom of Abraham and number them among the righteous. And may he also have mercy upon us and save us, for he is a good and merciful God who loves all humankind. May your memory be eternal, our brother and sister, worthy of blessings for lasting memory. May your memory be eternal, our ever blessed, ever rememberable mother, brother and sister. Eternal be the memory. Eternal be the memory, eternal be the memory, Eonia imni, Eonia imni, Eonia aftis imni, Eternal be the memory, eternal be the memory, 
May their memory be eternal. Through the prayers of our holy fathers and mothers, O Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen.